The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Visualizing Progress in the Treatment of Chronic Active Antibody-Mediated Rejection. A closer look at the clinical potential of targeting IL-6 to improve outcomes in the kidney transplant setting. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash RBD 860. Downloadable additional resources are also available. Hello, this is Dr. Stanley Jordan from Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. Welcome to this visual tour exploring the role of interleukin-6 in the pathophysiology of chronic active antibody-mediated rejection in the kidney transplant setting and the clinical potential of targeting IL-6 to treat this condition. The progression of uh, kidney transplant therapeutics has was really rev revolutionized in the 1990s. We saw significant improvements in short-term kidney outcomes uh, in patients who were treated with the novel agents, tacrolimus, cyclosporin, and mycophenolic acids. The T-cell-centric therapies th at that time resulted in improved reductions in uh, T-cell-mediated rejection, but however, we noted that long-term outcomes were not improved. And the reasons for this were unclear. Many people thought it was because of chronic cyclosporin or calcineurin inhibitor toxicity, possibly recurrent diseases or presence of diabetes and hypertension in these patients. Uh, we found that indeed this was not the case, that the cause for long-term failures was really related to chronic antibody rejection. And so in the first six weeks post-transplants, most graft biopsies show no major abnormalities, but from six weeks to six months, you will see T-cell-mediated rejection with borderline diagnosis uh, of uh, other uh, conditions. Often, uh, polyoma virus nephropathy will appear at that time and then will go away over six months. But after six months towards one year, what we see is the emergence of the chronic active antibody-mediated rejection as a major cause uh, for uh, findings on pathology, and we know this now results in poor outcomes. Approximately 40 to 50 percent of graft failures in the United States, of which there are approximately 5,000 per year, are due to chronic antibody rejection. So this has emerged as a major problem um, for us uh, as transplant physicians. Now, let's take a look uh, more closely at antibody-mediated rejection. Antibody-mediated rejection uh, is caused by donor-specific antibodies. Uh, these are usually against HLA proteins. These antibodies may be present before transplantation, and they may develop de novo following transplantation. And this is an important distinction because those that develop after transplantation um, are usually because patients are not adherent to their medications or have problems absorbing their medications. And this allows alloantigen recognition uh, by B cells and then production of antibodies uh, that react with a graft endothelium and cause the uh, clinical and pathologic features of antibody-mediated rejection. We know a lot more about these DSAs or donor-specific antibodies. We know that uh, complement activation capacities, usually IgG1 or IgG3, are very important in causing pathogenic injury uh, to the allografts. If they also activate complements, C1Q activating capacity is very important. We also know that just a direct binding to the endothelium of these antibodies can stimulate the endothelium to make cytokines such as interleukin-6 increase fibrosis, and increase in endothelial uh, luminal uh, obliteration, which results in uh, chronic injury to the allograft. An antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity is also very important, and this is mediated by macrophages and monocytes. The International BAMP classification of 2019 recognizes three diagnostic categories for antibody-mediated rejection. First, there has to be histologic evidence of microvascular inflammation, for example, glomerulitis and peritubular capillaritis. There has to be evidence of current or recent antibody interaction with the vascular endothelium, and this is measured by looking at C4D positivity. 
Three, serologic evidence of donor-specific antibodies, C4D staining, as mentioned before, is validated on the endothelium, and this may substitute for the presence of DSA. Active antibody-mediated rejection presents clinically as an acute kidney injury with hypertension, proteinuria, and um, uh, declining graft functions. Active antibody rejection uh, may respond better than the other forms of injury that are more chronic uh, to treatments with agents such as plasmapheresis, IVIG, and rituximab. How about chronic active antibody rejection? Uh, here we need, uh, uh, obviously, histologic evidence of microvascular inflammation that was uh, noted uh, before, but also evidence of chronic injury, which is transplant glomerulopathy. In biopsy showing morphologic evidence of chronic tissue injury and evidence of antibody interaction with the vascular endothelium, but no serum DSA or C4D staining, patients could be labeled as suspicious for antibody-mediated rejection. Now, we know that evolving diagnostic uh, techniques at the molecular level, such as a nanostring test, will help elucidate this by identifying suspicious as truly antibody rejection or more possibly cell-mediated rejection. But persistence of a subacute form for, uh, on biopsies of patients with deteriorating renal function and proteinuria uh, or on protocol biopsies uh, from patients with normal graft function with or without proteinuria, this, this would be also important. And it occurs from three months to five years post-transplant. And probably this is one of our most common findings in people that are out uh, post-transplant one year or more who are having problems with their uh, medications. The final form of antibody rejection is chronic antibody rejection that is inactive. And this shows histologic evidence of chronic tissue injury, including basement membrane duplication without microvascular inflammation and without C4D deposition. So there's no active component to this. It uh, presents as a progressive kidney allograft dysfunction and progressive proteinuria and hypertension and has a very poor prognosis. Now, approximately 25% of kidney transplant patients develop de novo donor-specific antibodies by 10 years after transplant. Chronic antibody-mediated rejection is the most common cause for kidney allograft failure, as we mentioned, and there are currently no formal treatment guidelines and no FDA-approved treatments for prevention of this uh, condition. Best practices treatment has consisted of intravenous immune globulin, plasma phoresis, and B-cell depleting antibodies, such as rituximab. In 2019, the Transplant Society uh, assembled a group of experts from around the world in Los Angeles to try to get at the heart of uh, recommendations for treatment of antibody rejection, specifically chronic active antibody-mediated rejection. It was a very uh, intense group of uh, presentations over two days, but the conclusions were a bit disappointing, as summarized on this slide. The aims of treatment are to preserve renal function, reduce histologic injury, and reduce the titer of donor-specific antibodies. However, there's no conclusive evidence to support any specific therapy, and thus treatment recommendations are largely based on expert opinion. And in summary, properly conducted and powered clinical trials of biologically plausible agents are urgently needed. Since then, there have been uh, several agents that are, have emerged, and I think these agents hold promise. There are several now that are out there, such as IgG endopeptidase, emlifidase, FC receptor neonatal inhibitors, newer generation of anti-CD20 antibodies, such as obinutuzumab, anti-CD38 or anti-plasma cell antibodies, anti-BCMA or B-cell maturation antigens hybridized with anti-CD3 bispecific antibodies, which may have a very important role in reducing plasma cell-generated antibodies uh, that are causing antibody-mediated rejection. And of course, BCMA-specific CAR T-cells are also being investigated. Other agents such as proteasome inhibitors, complement inhibitors, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and of course, anti-IL-6 and IL-6 receptor inhibitors are, 
have emerged as potential agents to treat these conditions. Today we will explore the role of IL-6 in the pathophysiology of antibody rejection and the rationale for blocking IL-6 signaling for the treatment of chronic antibody rejection. First of all, it's important to realize that IL-6 is a master regulator of cytokines in the body. It has effector functions for both innate and adaptive immunity. It is a broadly reactive pro-inflammatory cytokine, and it is also involved in the regulation of multiple physiologic processes, such as antibody formation by B cells. It induces T inflammatory cells, TH17 cells, suppresses T reg cell um, proliferation, all in a process to uh, create more inflammation, presumably to destroy invading bacteria. And we also know it may be important in tumorigenesis. So multiple, multiple roles for the cytokine in inflammatory conditions. Its impact on the liver is probably most notable in the sense that it induces C-reactive protein, serum amyloid A, fibrinogen, and hepcidin, which causes the anemia of chronic disease and suppresses albumin levels. Our dysregulated IL-6 production has also been associated with renal allograft rejection, and uh, high serum levels have been observed at, to be elevated immediately post-transplant in patients with uh, acute and chronic rejection. We have also noted that uh, high IL-6 IL and the cognate uh, protein, C-reactive protein, which is induced by IL-6, are elevated in patients on chronic dialysis. Uh, this is likely due to the inflammatory milieu of chronic exposure to foreign substances in the dialysis membranes. And this may have very important uh, consequences for these patients in terms of increasing car cardiovascular disease mor mortality and morbidity. So, in addition, the fact that we have high IL-6 levels during dialysis, it certainly could uh, enhance alloantibody production in those people who have been exposed and really uh, uh, create a, a big problem with trying to desensitize these patients if they have high antibodies when they're coming to transplant. So this, uh, this information would suggest there may be a rationale for using IL-6 blockade in desensitizing patients or to help reduce HLA antibodies. We have also seen that in highly HLA sensitized patients, uh, serum I IL-6 levels are elevated when patients experience antibody rejection, cell-mediated rejections, or any uh, ischemic injury to their kidneys. So it's not specific for antibody rejection, but it does uh, indicate that with injury to the kidney, IL-6 levels are elevated, and that this um, uh, may be associated with the kidney dysfunction. So the treatment of rejection episodes in these patients tended to reduce IL-6 level, and this could be a marker for monitoring efficacy of treatment in patients with these conditions. Interleukin-6 is, a, again, a very important cytokine, and to promote the development of antibody-secreting cells and activate the immune system uh, initially through uh, stimulating p-follicular cells in germinal centers. IL-6 stimulates IL-21 production by naive T cells, and the, th then this induces their maturation towards a t-follicular cell phenotype expressing CXCR5, IL-21, and the transcription factor BCL6. Naive B cells are recruited to germinal centers with the CXCR5 phenotype, and these uh, T follicular cells then start to activate uh, the naive B cells to move towards activated B cells and then memory B cells. So activated B cells in the germinal centers uh, are dependent on BLF1 expression uh, for maturation, and this is induced by IL-6. And activated naive B cells mature into memory B cells and IL-6 producing plasma blast, and this enhances more germinal center activity and also allows the plasma blast to progress to uh, mature plasma cells that are producing the high affinity antibodies against uh, allograft targets. It's interesting in this regard that plasma cells have the highest density of IL-6 receptors of any cells in our body.
And so they are very receptive to IL-6, and this helps them mature to, again, uh, uh, high affinity producing cells that uh, will destroy the graft. And IL-6 is also required for the class switch from IgM to IgG. IL-6 also is uh, important in T cell effector um, development, as mentioned before. IL-6 will uh, induce uh, T follicular cells uh, and also induce Th17 cells that would cause effector damage to the graft and suppress regulatory T cell development. We know that in uh, the uh, T cell uh, interactions with antigen presenting cells, IL-6 will suppress the expression of IL-2 receptor beta on the T cells. This is so that uh, we know that IL-2 is very important in increasing the development of regulatory T cells. And so when you block the IL-2 receptor beta, IL-2 cannot be utilized and cytokines such as IL-7 continue to drive T effector functions by and suppress T regulatory cells. So certainly this may be uh, relieved by anti-IL-6 therapy. And finally, in, in the Theo cell, recent data shows that, IL, that with antibody binding to HLA class II molecules on endothelium stimulate a lot of IL-6 in these cells, and this results in uh, activation of uh, immune cells, uh, T effector and B cells in the milieu of inflammation, and also allows these cells to produce excess collagens, which results in enamel proliferation and obliterative vasculopathy causing the features of antibody-mediated rejection. So in inhibition of IL-6, IL-6 or signaling, then could certainly disrupt a number of these inflammatory pathways. It could disrupt germinal center activity, reducing T effector cells, Th17 cells, increasing Bregs and regulatory T cells, uh, also prevent plasma blast progression to plasma cells and reduce uh, high affinity antibody production that could damage the allograft. Uh, by preventing class switch, uh, you would again also reduce the, uh, the pathogenic antibodies that could attack the allograft. IL-6 also is expressed, as we mentioned, in endothelium, and antibodies to IL-6 in in vitro models um, and also in in vivo models um, where animal proliferation of uh, arteries was seen with IL-6 expression, the use of anti-IL-6 therapy can reduce uh, uh, vascular injury and could also uh, help prevent the progression of chronic antibody injury through non-immune mechanisms in the sense that it's not regulating the T cells or B cells, but it is suppressing the target endothelial cell reactivity to these cytokines and injury molecules. Now, given the role of IL-6 in mediating the inflammatory and, Im and immunomodulatory pathways that are critical uh, for uh, uh, progression of antibody-mediated rejection, uh, interfering the, with the signal could represent a, a pathway forward for treatment. Now, the target agents would be for IL-6, IL-6R, and soluble IL-6R complexes and downstream Janus kinases which are JAK3 inhibitors, primarily. The most studied agents are tocilizumab and clazacuzumab. Tocilizumab is a humanized IgG1-kappa monoclonal antibody against the IL-6 receptor. It binds to both soluble and membrane-bound forms of IL-6. Bindings to soluble IL-6 receptor may lead to rebound effect following cessation of treatment due to accumulation of free IL-6 uh, in the plasma and without blockade of the receptor, this could cause rebound of uh, clinical disease. Currently, tocilizumab is approved for treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and capillary leak syndrome, as well as giant cell arteritis. On the other hand, clazacuzumab is an anti-IL-6 or anti-ligand monoclonal. Uh, it's extensively studied in normal individuals and patients with rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, Crohn's disease and graft-versus-host disease is produced in P. pastoris system, and in, which includes an N297A mutation, rendering it aglycosylated, thereby extending the serum half-life. It is not yet FDA approved for any indication. I think the most important paper that we have done uh, 
uh, is uh, looking at chronic antibody rejection, those patients with transplant glomerulopathy, as you call. And this was the first study of anti-IL-6 or IL-6R treatment uh, in kidney transplant patients. And we compared it to patients uh, uh, who received standard of care, which is IVIG, rituximab, plus or minus plex, all had transplant glomerulopathy. And they were treated for six to 12 months. In this long-term study, there was a significant benefit seen with tocilizumab treatment and improving graft survival, 91%, and patient survival, 80%, DSA reduction in EGFR compared to um, standard of care observed over a six-year period. But also looking at treatment um, with tocilizumab for chronic antibody rejection, we looked at uh, the individual slope change of EGFR in the tocilizumab-treated patients and analyzed you this by a, a linear mixed effect model, and individuals followed up for nearly seven years. What we saw briefly was that, uh, that with tocilizumab treatment, these patients have about a 4 cc per year decline in EGFR. Now, in a study by Irish and his colleagues, uh, which was a very important, um, uh, I think, centerpiece for assessing what kind of EGFR declines are seen in patients with uh, chronic antibody-mediated rejection. Uh, these investigators looked at 90 patients from three centers, uh, followed them over uh, five years, and saw a decline of about 10 cc's per year. Although this is not a direct comparison, it suggests that there may be some uh, benefit to using anti-IL-6 to stabilize uh, EGFR over time and improve long-term outcomes for these patients. Uh, this is a paper on tocilizumab by Labaca and all from Italy, and they saw similar findings to what we had previously described. Patients had reduced TG, uh, GFR was stabilized, significant reductions in DSA, and protocol bi biopsies after six months showed significant amelioration of microvascular inflammation in these patients. This has led to a study called Intercept. This is an ongoing study of, of phase three, looking at uh, tocilizumab plus standard of care, tacrolimus, microphenolic acids, and prednisone compared to standard of care alone for chronic antibody rejection. The primary outcome is going to be look at, looking at EGFR at 24 months. And of course, they'll look at HLA, DSAs, adverse events, uh, related to tocilizumab therapy. In a phase 1-2 trial in highly HLA-sensitized patients, which we carried out approximately two to three years ago, patients were initially treated with PLEX times five sessions, followed by IVIG and at the last PLEX. And the patients then received clazacuzumab, 25 milligrams sub-Q monthly, for approximately six months as a desensitization protocol. If patients were transplanted, they received uh, monthly clazacuzumab in addition to standard immunosuppression. Most patients had significant reductions in HLA antibodies at six months, allowing these tw uh, 20 of 20 patients entered in the study to be transplanted. Five patients experienced rejection episodes that were generally mild to moderate and easily treatable. Importantly, we did not note any DSA rebound in these patients over the 12 months observation. Mean EGFR at one year was 58 cc's per minute per 1.73 meters squared. The overall safety profile was acceptable. Importantly, we also saw at 6 to 12 months that the patients showed increases in Treg and Breg cells uh, with uh, continued blockage of the uh, IL-6, IL-6 receptor system, which we feel was important in preserving their graft function and preventing rejection. We saw also in a treatment of, with clazacuzumab for chronic antibody rejection that we could stabilize EGFR. Uh, this has also been published. Uh, and important conclusions from this is that uh, we did see declining EGFR at minus 24 months to time zero but after initiation of clazacuzumab, EGFR stabilizes over the next two years. Patients in the study have now been in the, on drug for five years or more. We also saw reductions in DSA. This study is also very important. Building a, a story for anti-IL-6 is just a, uh, 
uh, a study from uh, Germany and from Austria. It's a phase two study of clazacuzumab for chronic antibody rejection. Patients were randomized one to one and were uh, uh, to receive placebo or drug in 12 weeks and followed for 40 uh, weeks. The patients receiving Clasa displayed significantly decreased DSAs. Um, uh, also, 38.9% of patients' biopsies done as protocol biopsies showed complete resolution of the molecular diagnosis for antibody rejection, and C4D deposits were also reduced. Proteinuria remained stable. Importantly, mean EGFR was uh, uh, stabilized and uh, compared to placebo that was declining. So this was a significant uh, finding. This is the IMAGINE study. This is a very, very important study, and I would like to uh, bring it to everyone's attention. Certainly, if you're uh, in kidney transplantation and deal with these patients, it would be important to consider the study for those patients. Uh, this is a one-to-one -one randomization of clazacuzumab versus placebo every four weeks sub-Q, and these are for patients who have HLA DSA positive, chronic antibody mediated rejection. The endpoints will be EGFR differences at one year after 200 patients have been uh, enrolled in the study. The study is underway. Uh, at this point, there are approximately 130 or 140 patients in the study. So after 200 are entered and one year later, um, uh, uh, this drug could potentially receive conditional approval for treatment of chronic antibody rejection. Also, going back to our, you know, our original data where we looked at patients on dialysis, we saw a high IL-6, high C-reactive protein. Um, uh, there is now a study called the possible 6-ESKD or uh, study, which is a phase 2B3 study to evaluate cardiovascular uh, risk outcomes in end-stage kidney disease patients on dialysis uh, and determine if uh, clazacuzumab, anti-IL-6, could reduce uh, systemic inflammation uh, and um, uh, deaths from uh, cardiovascular disease or stroke. So this will be a very, very important study, I think, uh, on, the, on the other side of the coin, hopefully reducing risk for uh, cardiovascular mortality for patients who are going to come to uh, transplantation. So potential for this drug and uh, kidney disease care and transplantation are emerging. So key takeaways today, we know that <clears throat> from the initial studies, I'm going back historically, that we've had a T-cell centric uh, approach to immunosuppression, but uh, over time we realized that this didn't improve long-term outcomes. And the long-term outcomes we now know are, are primarily affected by the emergence of antibody mediated rejection caused by DSA. Some of these are HLA. Uh, however, uh, not all are, and non-HLA donor antibodies are an important consideration here as well. And again, there's currently no formal guidelines uh, or no FDA-approved therapies. We're working very hard on that at this time. We think that IL-6 uh, has a pleiotropic cytokine that is uh, has uh, important in interactions with the immune system in terms of uh, activating both innate and adaptive immune responses uh, can be a target for uh, um, uh, treatment of uh, both active in uh, antibody rejection and potentially chronic active antibody rejection. And the most studied agents so far, as we mentioned, are uh, tocilizumab and clazacuzumab, and they both show promise in uh, treatment uh, and uh, uh, chronic active antibody rejection and also as desensitization agents. Uh, however, clazacuzumab uh, is uh, the only agent at this point that is undergoing study for labeling uh, in, uh, by the FDA. And uh, th that trial is the IMAGINE trial. Also, and I think it is important to realize that the IL-6 will be an important target in dialysis patients, trying to prevent them from having cardiovascular mortality and the results of the study of clazacuzumab and uh, 